progress of a nation can be measured by the progress of the women in that society. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the one day national seminar on the topic of women and, women and economic development. Conducted by the Department of Economics of Kerala University. Without further ado, let me invite Meera Parvati, second year MA economic student to calling on respected dignitaries in the lives. As we all know, the women is the whole heart and soul of each and every progressive nation. So without not much introduction, let me move to my duty. First of all, I would like to welcome Siddiq R, Assistant Professor, Organizing Secretary of this first one day, uh, inter one day national seminar on women and economic development. With a load of happiness and pride, we welcome you, sir. Then I would like to welcome the chair of this session, Dr. Abdul Salim B, Professor and Head of the Department of Economics. As we all know, he is the constant sort of inspiration and uh, a true example of hard work to this department with much honor and privilege. We welcome you, sir. Then I would like to welcome the key speaker of this inaugural session, Ms. Mrithul Ethan, member of Kerala State Planning Board and Honorary Fellow CBS. It is indeed a privilege to welcome you, madam. Welcome, ma'am. <laughs> then I would like to welcome all other faculty members of this department and students of this department. It is, I hope this will be a fruitful occasion for our brains. Once again, I welcome you all. Thank you. They, my, my duty is actually to talk about uh, the women and economic development. Uh, this is actually a very important topic which is normally left out in the academia, uh, especially in the economics department of yeah. we of late only start discussing about uh, women and economic development, especially the role of women uh, in the productive activities and how they were the part and parcel of the very productive structure of uh, whatever production in the society or in the economy in that. So in that context, so the role of women is especially, no need to mention, but in the context of uh, uh, leaving the women out of uh, all the computational, getting it sent, uh, computational method of uh, production as well as national income accounting. Talking about a women's contribution in the economy is making its own sense. So that is actually the context which we are introducing and we are actually trying, uh, trying to organize a seminar of this sort. And this is actually last year we started uh, organizing, we, we plan to organize the seminar from the last year onwards as a regular program of every year to talk about uh, the contribution of women from various angles of social uh, production as well as the economic interaction. But unfortunately it never materialized last year. So, uh, at any cost, uh, we have to actually start this program initiative from the Department of Economics University of Canada. And that, that is why even, uh, even actually uh, getting to know that today is a hard or a uh, you know, strike, we, we still want to organize the, uh, the program without any fail. So that is actually the real motivation and the importance of the subject which is indeed we are going to talk about. So, that is about the introduction. Of course, we know that as part of the Millennium Development Goal as well as later uh, sustainable development goals of the uh, United Nations as well as other uh, developmental uh, programs across the world. The uh, development of any economy or the world at large cannot be fulfilled if you don't actually talk about the importance of the contribution of a society at large. So that is why this motive or as well as the motto is, is basically got its own place in the literature as well as the discourse of development. So in this context, let me actually uh, uh, in, uh, uh, um, uh, open this uh, seminar in, in, in a much fruitful way and I hope that there are five uh, speakers going to have uh, their own uh, deliberation today. Uh, first is none other than Professor Madhu Vipan who is actually a veteran in this field. In fact, she had an, uh, done enormous work on uh, the works of women in a uh, very uh, life of uh, productive life of uh, our economy, especially in the small, small scale sector and in the uh, informal sector, farmer sector, all kinds of uh, sectors where how the women is in fact contributing uh, to the building of the nation or economy per se. So I I, I feel that uh, Professor Nathalie uh is the right person in fact to talk about and discuss her view 
with the young generation in that context. And the second speaker is from uh, Sandhya Isin from Kerala Council of Historical Research. <coughs> she is also constantly working and talking about different aspects of women, especially the status of women at large, especially from a historical point of view and how women is being treated itself. So in that context and economies, economic students can also understand the various dimensions, how the society historically treats women and all. So the session, the second session, the upcoming session is also going to talk about in that line. That is how the status of women is being understood in the Kerala context uh, in particular. The third uh, uh, presentation today is actually going to be delivered by Prof. Uh, Professor Vishni Govalakrishnan, a constitutional expert. Uh, she was earlier with the University of Kerala and now the Dean as well as the Professor of Mahatma Gandhi University. And she is going to actually talk about how constitutionality is going to uh, deliberate uh, the role of women and uh, what are the different uh, dimensions which in fact uh, leave a, a, a very uh, subject itself. And uh, then we have a, third, a fourth speaker, Shivrin Shakti. She is also working on actually how the armed forces, basically, this context is very important. And the armed forces and the role of women in the armed forces is being discussed today. So we will have a very fruitful discussion from that angle also. And the final speaker is none other than Professor Jirei Deviga. And all of you are very familiar with her own works and discussion itself. So uh, she is going to be uh, particularly emphasizing on the matter of uh, the, uh, the small scale aspect, so the, the grassroots level movement of women in Kerala, particularly the Guru Muslim project and uh, how it is basically working in the social stratum. So in that context, we are actually covering a whole range of uh, women issue and uh, the role of women in the state building, nation building, etc. So in that context, I feel that uh, the seminar is going to throw some light on the uh, light on different aspect of women and economic development. With this word, few words, I now invite uh, Professor Adil Sidin to... Uh, a warm good morning to Honor Dr. Yeah. Sidhiya. Uh, Honorable uh, member, Kerala State Planning Board, Professor Mithil Kumaradil Deepan. Um, Organizing Secretary of the One Day Event, uh, Mr. Siddiq, my dear colleagues in the department, uh, my friends from the other departments, uh, research scholars, students, staff uh, of various departments of the university. Uh, in fact, uh, till uh, the morning, we were expecting some 100 participants. Morning only we came to know about the uh, Hartal. Uh, so that way we are un unfortunate of uh, building this hall. Uh, but even now we are expecting some 50 participants uh, within a few minutes time, more are yet to come. They are expected to come. Uh, so number does not matter. Even if some 5 to 10 percent of the students uh, get benefit out of the events like this, that is going to be, uh, my, my, my impression is that that is going to be uh, a success as far as the uh, events like these, the academic like, uh, the events like these are concerned. Uh, one more important factor with respect to the difficulty in organizing all these events is that generally uh, every year uh, we used to conduct academic events, uh, but the problem is that we are getting funds only during the last quarter of uh, uh, quarter of the financial year. I am saying this in the presence of the planning board member uh, who can also intervene in this particular matter. See, we used to represent the university for organizing all these events right from the beginning of the financial year, but they are getting funds uh, from December or December last or January onwards. So, within that single quarter, we, we were forced to organize five to six programs. Now, we are in the sixth. Today is the sixth program. So, uh, see, when we discussed the matter with the authority of the university, uh, sir, within these three months time, it is very difficult to organize all these things. No, 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 you should organize and you should uh, utilize the money. Otherwise, you are not going to get it next year. So, if they say like this, see, you know the difficulty in getting all the resource persons, organizing all these, and they mean, uh, this is the time of examination. Uh, last Friday, only our senior students were relieved from the examination. 
see many of these students uh, straight away uh, have gone to their houses because they need to, need they, they need to meet their parents etc and because of the birth, uh, no you know uh, they, they can't get out uh, so several problems are there in organizing the academic events like these but remember that this is a very the, the issue that we are going to discuss is a very important issue and for the last several days Mr. Siddiq has been uh, working uh, day and night to make this event a, a great success with the help of the students in the department. I am thankful to Mr. Siddiq for conceiving a team like this and uh, identifying the right resource persons and uh, making this event, uh, I, I, this event I expected to be a great success. Uh, coming to the uh, uh, the theme of this particular event, as I told you earlier, economic empowerment and uh, human empowerment and economic development are closely related. Uh, there is a mutually reinforcing relationship between these two. See, in one direction, development alone can play a major role in driving down gender inequality. In another direction, empowering women may benefit development. But our policy makers, many of them, uh, while conceiving many policies and the programs, they do not seem to realize this mutually reinforcing relationship. Uh, they do not view women as integral to the economic development process. Uh, rather, they focus on women's reproductive roles, not their productive roles in economic activities. But you know, yet our women throughout the world engage in economically productive work and earn income. They work primarily in agriculture and increasingly in informal sector, but their earnings are low. In getting earnings in their wages, they are being discriminated. You know the case of agricultural wages uh, obtained by women uh, who are in the fields. Uh, our constitution, the constitution of India provides equal rights for men and women. It also makes special provisions to improve the status of women in society. Yet we know the strong patriarchal traditions are followed and the women's lives are shaped by social customs. Remember that their lives are mostly shaped by social customs. See, the situation is not much different in the case of Kerala also. Some improvement is uh, there in Kerala as compared to the other women in the other states in India, but no, uh, not much significant improvement has uh, attained even in Kerala also. In this context, it is expected that this uh, seminar, is, this one day, even with all these resource persons, is going to discuss uh, some of these pertinent issues and come out, come, uh, come out with some uh, suggestions, some alternative solutions uh, to this important issue of human empowerment and economic development. I wish all the success for this event. Thank you. Let me just uh, react to what uh, Dr. Salim said about planning board doing something about giving your money evenly spread throughout the year. We can't do that. We give you the money at the start of the year. That is the planning board responsibility. And at the start of that, April 1st, you will know how much money Kerala University has got. Now, after that, it's the responsibility of the university to chase the finance and say, look, we want, you have to prepare your proposals and take them to one of all the working groups. I don't know how universities work, whether they can do it on their own, they don't have to go to They do have actually a director of the and the So they decide. They will come actually to normally they represent the university and the Where? In finance and planning. Planning board, you have done the job is over for us. Then you have to chase them, like what the departments do. Departments have working groups. <laughs> where they put their proposals and their sanction. University may be happening another way. It's not a, it's a, a word document. Uh, gender and development policy, I think. There will be so many on that, and you get mixed up. Right? It's a G G G one. Probably doesn't even have a heading. Uh, <coughs> so that is one thing I wanted to tell you all, that you all have to ask your DPD to push things through. Yes. OK? That's, we cannot do anything. So uh, let me make it clear. But what we can do is, if you all have good proposals, and you know, all the universities come up with good things, maybe more money can be given to the 
that's the thing planning work can but at least you can suggest something to release this money at the uh, <coughs> time to uh, no no something no. to the finance department and no no we can't do it that's their way of functioning okay. <laughs> we, can't, we can't do anything about that uh, sorry okay so you are talking every department has a person uh, posted specifically to chase the finance to chase the file so something like that you are having to do now coming to what uh, good morning to all and the respected chair and uh, siddhi uh, i'm really happy to be here i think uh, whatever numbers there are and you know it's still something which needs to be discussed really because uh, recent events have shown you know how much need there is for a cultural change still in kerala how much need there is you know so that was the biggest shock i got after so many years that uh, you know there is uh, we keep talking about economic development uh, there is need also to tie it up with the social type of development that we need it's very very important we can't just focus on so uh, let me say when we talk about development policy what do we mean we mean what is it supposed to do it's supposed to uh, reduce uh, or resolve problems of poverty <coughs> deprivation and unemployment which should be sustainable i mean whatever we are doing it we should be able to sustain it over time and however so we we all know that this is development policy but that is problem that gender specific <coughs> is not sufficiently realized the, and it is becoming increasingly clear that development is not gender neutral okay when i say gender neutral what i mean is that it impacts on men and women similarly no that has become very clear and the interesting part is that uh, you know the when you introduce the concept of gender in planning which i'll explain to you why we need to introduce it when you introduce the concept of gender in planning it makes it possible to view the inequality that exists in society and once you see the inequality in society can anyone tell me that you know from your own experience and what you see around you can you think that there is a certain inequality in society in terms of the roles that men and women play can anyone see any inequality in that can you see any inequality the roles that men and women play or girls and boys play do you feel that there is an inequality which works against women can you see that what is the underlying assumption in society what is the underlying assumption that men are the breadwinners they move into public spaces they earn money and come women are the homemakers to some extent it is considered natural why is it considered natural because women bear children so for that period they confined to the house maybe 6 months after the baby is born they have to be confined to the house but that now is the society has ascribed the role of a homemaker to the woman whether or not she is needed after 6 months only for the child the mother is needed you know that sort of thing has got into people's mind that yes a woman's home place is really in the in the home to look after the bare children to look after the children to do all the unpaid to, to do all the household work to look after the elderly and to look after the sick if any in the household so this <coughs> uh, uh, implicit or what should i say when it's explicit also but this is the underlying assumption in society if you think of a household there is a man who earns a woman who, who is the homemaker now who oh, i didn't bring my mouse okay okay i look here and i tell you all i have to move what a i just it doesn't move without the mouse ha eh? can i i don't know what all these new techniques are please you can use paper Ha, shall I sit down there then? Yeah. Or okay, I'll, I'll sit like I stand like this. Keep sitting. It's okay. So keep moving it. That's all. So we know that it makes it possible to view the inequality that exists. I just told you about the inequality that exists in society. Okay. Uh, and on this inequality rests the whole structure of gender discriminatory norms and practices, which uh, this for me to click. familiar with technology as men because the usual perception is that women technology don't put them anywhere near technology so this i'm proving it unfortunately but, so
So, uh, so this on this rests a whole lot of discriminatory you know, norms. What sort of norms could there be which are oppressive to women? You know that fully wise mobility of women is so much restricted. Okay. Not only that because the household work is there, but because of the vulnerability to violence if you are out late in the night. So you know there is a lot of discrimination which is which is built up because a woman has to be uh, what should I say uh, to 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 be the mother in a household and a wife in a household she has to be pure. Okay, there can be no there is no uh, no way in which we can uh, accept a woman who may have had uh, relations, pre-marital relations with any, any man. So we, we have to keep the woman safe in the house, that she is actually just the single uh, person belonging to a certain household. So you said there are so many norms and practices which are built up upon this division of work between men and women. Uh, and even if she does paid work, now I'm sure all of you after studying here, yeah, you'll be wanting to go and do some work. Even if she does paid work outside the house, there's a lot of housework she still housework she still has to do. She has to go back. Those of us who can afford to have domestic workers can reduce our household burden to some extent. Those who cannot have to do what? They have to get up early in the morning, do the cooking, look after the children, to go, send them to school, then go for work, then come back and restart the cycle all over again. So the point is that this is still going on. And that is what I mean by the cultural change. Unless men and women start thinking, now of course we have other, the uh, sexual minorities, the other the individuals with different sexual orientation, gender orientations, all of these, you know. Now we have to realize that some of the stereotypes that have been given to us are now gone. We cannot stick to those stereotypes. The time has come for us to change. It is very important for us to learn. So even if she works outside the home, she has to come back, as I said. And what also, there's another implication. If I am worried about catching my bus at 5 o'clock so that I can reach home and start my household work all over again, I will be less committed. That is how I will be considered. That look, she's already looking at her watch at 4.30, but she has to go. So, you know, these are the sorts of things which then get uh, ascribed to women. They are not committed to their work. They are only thinking about their household. They have no time for politics, no time for technology. All these sorts of things get ascribed to the women. And they are not safe late in the evening. So we should not, we should be very careful to keep them inside their homes. You heard about the famous play which came out by Viti Kachadripar, Adkalai Dhenna Arena Teka. I mean, that was, I think, the, the classic way of describing the position of even upper caste women. Forget about the lower caste women. So, this puts the women <coughs> Uh, in a dependent position. So, putting the society perceives her like that, even in a household where the man is unemployed and the woman is actually bringing the income, she is, it's not recognized as a woman's household. Only if the man is not there, we'll say female headed. Otherwise, it's a male headed, even if the man is unemployed, which happens in many of the families that the man may not be working, the women do any type of work for which they get any low income, but they do it because of their family. And therefore, they are the ones sustaining the household, but we still consider that household as a male-headed household. And the man can beat her if he wants. Also, if he's that type, that can also happen, even if the woman is an educated working woman. So these are the sort of norms which have been built up on these sorts of this sort of division of labor, what we call the social division of labor in society. So, so this high unequal sharing of household work is not considered, you know, you were saying that uh, the, in their work is not counted in the national income. Why does it not get counted? Because it doesn't enter the national income. It doesn't enter the system of national accounts. The unpaid household care and care work does not enter because that's how economics is defined. It refers only to what is paid and is transacted in the market. So women's unpaid household work does not get recognized. And what is the assumption? The assumption is what is macroeconomic, you must have, you, you are familiar with macroeconomic policies, fiscal policy, monetary policy, employment, export, import, trade policy, all these are macro policies. Now, what does macroeconomic policy assume? That woman's time in household work is infinitely elastic. And that is how the women are actually themselves thinking of themselves. 
So if you say the public employment now we uh, we are retren retrenching thousand workers in a public sector company, and all those thousand workers are out of work, what will the women do? They will not abandon their households now. They will then go for Narega work, or they may go for uh, some self-help group work where they get some income, 200, 300, 400 rupees, if they get, they will do that. So that they earn something to sustain their families. So their time is supposed, assumed to be infinitely elastic. That's the way the macroeconomic policy works. And so whatever changes occur in the macroeconomic, and you know that after globalization, liberalization, a lot of changes have come in the macroeconomic policies. You know, which is for instance the reduction in healthcare, educational systems, all this has been happening because of the, and the privatization which has put a price on everything. So how do poor households manage? They then try, the women try to do as much as they can at home so that they don't have to purchase from the market. So there is a lot of, you know, uh, they, uh, this is a sort of assumption which is made in macroeconomic development policy. And therefore, uh, it is very interesting, you know, if you look at our macroeconomics now, and you think back of the earlier period, for instance, the period of the late 19th century, a lot of social transformation was occurring. You know, the Industrial Revolution was going on, Marxism, Leninism, um, Engels, Babel, and they were talking about the woman question. There was a very interesting discussion on the woman question, what we call gender issues now. They were talking about the woman question. Why did they talk about that? Can anyone tell me why are we saying women and women? Why are we not saying men and women? Can anyone just, any answer, can be stupid, I say, doesn't matter, but venture something. What, what was the woman question, what is the gender issue according to you? I just explained to you the, the division of roles, isn't it? So what is the woman question? Suppose a woman has been ascribed this responsibility of looking after the household and bearing children. What, what is it in the society, what are we looking for? When we're talking about women, what are we saying? We are saying, what is the position of women in our social organism? That is what the socialists were discussing at that time. So, because they wanted to include women as equal partners in the development process. They knew that the women had a lot to contribute. Okay? So, what is the position of a woman in our social organism? How can she best develop her powers and abilities in order to become a useful member of human society endowed with equal rights and serving society with the best of her abilities. <coughs> Why was this question being raised? Because they knew that there is this major constraint on, on women because of the household and care work. And uh, Engels had said, till you liberate the women from this, there will be no emancipation for women. He said that. But you know, we know that women are also vulnerable as women. So even if you liberate them from household work, there is still inequality which exists in society. So now, you see, so this was being discussed by the socialists because they were looking at women as part of the whole transformation, what they call the social transformation policy. But what happened in the, the non-socialist countries? Nobody discussed women at all. We discussed development. And we said development will trickle down to everybody. It's not going to distinguish between men and women, girls and boys, transgender, nothing. Development means development for all. So it will trickle down to everybody. Nobody thought of taking up the issue of women's household work and care work and the need for public investment in these activities. Because otherwise how do women how do women get out of the household or how do women get out of the kitchen to do work in public spaces? You understand? So this that one thing was of course by the now look I get stuck, somebody please come here. I don't know what the way I push it. I just want to go up a little bit now. Okay, this is the way I think. Uh, this way, yeah. okay. Yeah. So this, the socialist question in the 1870s was th thoroughly discussed, and Weber made it very clear that women are an integral part of socialist policy. Now, surprisingly, and it was very interesting when I came across this in pre-independence India. You know that we know that all these luminaries, Sarojini Naidu, Vijayalakshmi Pandit, Durga Bai Deshmukh. So many people were there in the nationalist movement. They were not the ones to think that women have to sit in the kitchen. Like Babel, in, in that time, there were, were a big discussion, you know, in the 1870s. Some people were saying, there is no woman question. The role is in the household. What are you bothered about? We don't have to worry about anything. 
Let them be in the house, let them deliver children, let them look after the children, let them look after the household. That is their natural calling. It was called the natural calling. But the Marxists were arguing, no, that is not correct. They have their own abilities, their own confidence, their own ways of, or their own rights as women, and that's what we must respect. Now, a similar thing happened in pre-independence India. In 1935, there was a national planning committee which was formed by the Congress Socialist Party, I think, or Congress Party, I don't know what it was called at that time. And because of the war came in between, the, they had a, what is called the National Planning Committee, and they set up 34 or 44, I don't remember, subcommittees on different areas, like we do in the, at the start of our five-year plans. We have all these working groups on different sectors and they will then tell us what is happening in that sector and what we need to go to move forward in that sector. And there was a subcommittee on women. In this national uh, planning committee, there was a subcommittee on women, which reported in uh, 45, but I think it came out in 47, because of the war in between. And uh, it was called the role of women, women in a planned economy. That is what it's called. Chairperson was our Lakshmi by uh, Rajwadi. And as I said, this contained uh, luminaries like uh, Sarojini Naidu and uh, all these, uh, I had it with me somewhere here, yeah. the constitution. There was uh, the chairperson was Lakshmi by Rajwadi and there was Indra by Bhagavad, there was Vijayalakshmi uh, uh, Pandit, Rameshwari Nehru, there was Durga by Deshmukh, Sarojini Naidu. I mean, the whole lot of these women who had been very active in the nationalist movement. So, then, if you look at the term of reference of that committee, it's really so heartening that there was a time when actually women were being pulled into the planned process. But somehow, after independence, that completely got. Because after independence, we went in for a very different type of macroeconomic policies, which completely left out the role of women in the household. So, if you look at the terms of reference of the subcommittee, it states, this report considers the entire structure of planned economy with women as the focus. Okay, all structure, the whole structure, that means every sector in the economy, they will look at it from the point of view of, of women. What are they doing? What should they be doing in that sector? All this is going to be looked at. What we call now, looking at a sector through the gender lens. Okay, so this sort of a thing that women are not only confined to the women and child development, but they have a role in every sector, actually came to us nationally at the 11th plan time. The 11th plan, they said we have to look at the women, not only in the uh, women and child development, but because there is evidence uh, that women are there in every agriculture, small scale industries, traditional industries, rural development, wherever you look, there are women there. So we can't just think of women confined to as welfare agents, you know, people who get benefits and some sort of uh, doles in the uh, women and child development, but we have to look at them across uh, all departments. So this uh, working committee, the subcommittee had said that they will review every field in which women operate or should operate to contribute their share of the nation's wealth and well-being of the people. And, listen, this, this is the last sentence, is very interesting to me. The cultural and spiritual position of women and its impact on nation's life and work cannot be ignored. Have we ever said that anywhere in our documents? Plan or non-plan, anything. We have never said that. Now, this is something which we realize strongly in the context of the Sabrimala issue. That, as I said, we sort of woke up. I mean, each time, of course, we were putting money. We were putting money in the budget for gender awareness, what we call. Let's make Kerala a gender conscious society by teaching right from the school itself, you know, how, what is gender, what is the issue, you know, how both are, you know, equal partners in, in development. All that we used to, uh, in each plan we used to keep that. That is after gender budgeting started in Kerala. But when the Sabrimala came, we found that, okay, that is not enough. Then comes the wall. Then comes the mother that gave such hope. Look, people came out in such large numbers, you know. Whatever the critics may say, no, no, they were forced to come, or you know, they were threatened that they will, something will happen, or they were given money to come, whatever it is, 50 lakh women cannot come out in a 620 kilometer long wall without some, you know, feeling of uh, solidarity. 
So, when this Sabrimala thing came, we thought we need to strengthen our gender awareness program. That became very clear. And uh, it did not appear comprehensive enough. And then the Vanita mother, on a pan Kerala scale, we shook up the people and our effort now is to sustain the momentum. That is the effort now, how to sustain the momentum. Now, how did we bring in women's issues into macroeconomic development? So what is called a gender budget. Budget, we know, is part of fiscal policy, macroeconomic policy. So, we, so you know, a lot of work was going on among the women's movement, among the women's groups, that whatever is happening, the situation doesn't seem to be uh, uh, improving. In 74, the Committee on the Status of Women in uh, India, that came out, and they found they get alarming results. The participation rate is declining of women, okay? Sex ratio is declining, poverty is growing among women. I mean, these things came out again from a committee which had people like Bina Majumdar. I, I don't remember the sociologist who was there. Who was the sociologist, Siddhi? A very well-known woman sociologist, uh, Dube, some Dube. No, all these people, they were the, the committee is still, is, is a very well-known document. If anyone wants to work on women, there is one committee report you all should read, plus of course the Seva report of Ila Bhars, Shram Shakti. These are things that you all have to read to know about the women's issues and the women's problems. It was not that people were not tackling that, but I am saying that the problem was so enormous that we are still tackling with how to, to get out of this cultural bind that creates the barriers for women. So, so we have been attempting to mainstream gender, what is called mainstreaming gender. That is put every sector through a gender lens. If it is agriculture, we know that they are farmers, we know that they are, they are agricultural laborers. Can we have separate schemes for women? <laughs> Extension work, for instance, sometimes does not touch the women farmers at all. Because they may be called to some organization for classes, which they cannot go to. So the point is, Unless you recognize women's unpaid household and care work and the constraints it poses on their participation in the paid economy, you will not be able to sort out the problem of their participation. So that is why we have to keep that in mind. That is why I say development is not gender neutral. Whenever you make a budget and you are having something on employment for instance, whether it's ITIs, and you say, okay, we have, uh, 30 percent of ITI inmates will be women. But when you go and see the ITI, there are very few girls. So I asked, what is happening? So they said, we don't know. So I said, give them noon meals. I just said, there was another person with me. He said, why don't you try giving noon meals to them? Because maybe in the early morning, they may not be able to pack up any time. You know, it worked. So I'm saying that, you know, people who, who realize that there is this issue, and if the government now slowly we're trying to impress upon the department officials how important it is to keep these things in mind and to say that, okay, when we have a project, Startup Mission has now a project, 70 crores they have got. 10% is supposed to be for women startups. I think the university has some <coughs> incubation or yeah. something like that in your university here. Yes. So, you have to, if women are not coming, then ask the question, why are they not coming? Because they, you know, they, 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 they do MA and uh, we know masters in general arts and sciences, 68% are women. Where do they go? After that, where do they go? Either they get married and then they have to sit at home. Or some of the more courageous and the brave ones and you know, the more determined ones do come and work. And that is very important. They need to be free economically. That economic empowerment is very essential. You know? Some people say, we are very happy at home. My husband is learning so much. Why should I go for work? Everything is good if the marriage is going on happily. But suppose if something happens. I mean, I'm, I would pray nothing should happen. I mean, I don't pray sorry. I would wish nothing will happen. But suppose if something happens, the woman is left completely helpless. She doesn't even know how to interact with any official, for instance, to get even her due rights, to go to the court. Even things like that she does not know. So that is what the whole thing is about, that you have to, you know, visualize women's work and their contribution and then see how we can make special programs to be able to move them up in the ladder of whether it's work, whether it's uh, social uh, this thinking, they should really be coming up in, their, in society to be able to display their abilities, 
and to, to show how much they can contribute to, to society. Now, of course, as we know, girls are coming out in different, very non stereotype of activities, you know. There will be a pilot you think of, they are running the metro, all the uh, local pilots are, uh, are women uh, or transgender also. So, or they may be uh, doing um, bus driving, another, you know. So, if more and more girls come out to work, the society will definitely uh, take a change. Even in the planning world, we were having a discussion the other day, and the men said, you know, why do you say that men don't work at home? I said, that's what we find, that men don't want, usually do the household work. The woman has to do it. Then they said, you know, if women, is, women are also working, at some point of time it becomes compulsory. Because men will see that, you know, okay, the household will, cannot run if the woman has to be so harassed the whole day. So they will also start helping. So one way, of course, is to give employment to women. But the other reason is that there should be a, a, a redistributive, just agenda. Why should it be, even if the woman is not working, for instance, even if the woman is not working, why should she alone do all that very tedious and laborious household work? Why can't men also participate in it? So, that is what the UN, CEDA is called the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. CEDA it's called. That, and the SDG Goal 5 has a very clear para on how we should recognize, reduce, redistribute household and unpaid care work for women so that men participate. There's a, a just agenda should be there for redistribution. So in our attempt at uh, gender response, we call it gender responsive budgeting. That's what it's called. So responding to the gender issue and then you are preparing the budget. Recognizes the economic signal. The way we are doing it in Kerala, we are taking a more expansive view of women. Meaning we know that they have these other duties also. So it recognizes the economic significance of women's unpaid work in the household which tends to be neglected in macroeconomic development policy. Foregrounding women's unpaid work and the constraints it poses to women's participation in paid work in public spaces is therefore central to the debate on rethinking macroeconomic frameworks from a gender perspective. And gender responsive budgeting, as I said, is an entry point into macroeconomic policy. Gender budgeting in Kerala has through a process of learning. We started in the 11th plan. I don't remember, I don't know how many of you remember that it, it was a political commitment. The government stated, that is the finance minister, in his uh, interim, uh, but what is it called, the, the, the budget which comes after the one government falls and the other, it's not the interim. It was uh, in 16, uh, the re, uh, there's a word for it. The budget which came in 16 uh, June or July, the one the budget had been made by the previous uh, UDF, but when the LDF came to power in May 16, I think, they had another budget. In that budget, it was announced that we are going to be doing gender budgeting in Kerala. So it was a political commitment. That's what I'm saying. It has to become a part of political policy. So it has a through process of learning. It taken a much more expansive view on women's lives and roles they play, not only in terms of their potential as aid workers, but more importantly through their invisibilized <laughs> unpaid work in social reproduction and their inability very often to make choices as individuals. We know that. When we are making a choice, we think of our children, we think of our husband also. Okay? We, we, we very rarely that we make a choice which is benefiting only us, unless there is enough resources to do that. So they sometimes they are not able to make the choices which really benefit them because they have to think of their house. Good IT job in Bangalore, maybe I will not move. Because I know what happens to my family here. So I will do something lesser than that, but within, you know, within some nearness to my home so that I can combine my household work with my paid work. So you see, in a way, your unpaid work is also supporting your paid work of the men and women. So the men also are then, you know, free to, to move around or even if they get transferred, we know that they do go. They can go because somebody is there to look after the household. So there is a lot of support from the unpaid work for the paid economy. That's also one something you all should see. So it is increasingly becoming clear. Let me conclude now. I'm not giving you the whole um, details of the gender budgeting, but what we do in the gender budget is really 
to look at, of course, how to increase women's participation in paid work. I don't know whether you all have come across this whole issue of the declining workforce participation rates in Kerala and India. And Kerala is more uh, terrifying because we have such high levels of literacy. So educated unemployment rates are absolutely, uh, I mean, you know, mind-boggling. 50%, 60% of women in rural areas are unemployed, educated women. So we want to increase their employment potential, but at the same time, we have to have an enabling environment to, be, to allow them to come out to work. So increased exp um, allocations to anganwadis, other types of daycare centers, what are called daycare centers for the older people, Sayan Prabha, and then the social justice department. So that you put your mother or father in that in the morning when you go for work and you collect them back in the evening. So, you know, things like that we have to try and do to make better transportation services for them if possible. You know, make buses available at the time that women move to the secretariat office, have more buses at that time. So there are so many ways in which we can help the women to reduce the burden that this whole under unpaid household and care work as for them. So that is something which we are trying to do through the budget. I have a copy of it every year now from the 13th plan. I don't know whether you all know that Kerala is the only state which is still doing the five year plan. So we have a 13th plan now. And 17, 18 we brought out a separate budget on uh, gender and child budget we called it. It is culled out from the main budget but it is given as a separate document. And uh, this from for the last three years now we are bringing it out. So it is now, in, but now three years of doing this, I myself have become a little dissatisfied because I feel that one thing is of course that it is increasingly becoming clear that without doing away with certain blind beliefs regarding women, one of them being that menstruation is polluting and impure. I mean, I still cannot understand how any sensible woman can think like that. Something which is, this is natural, a very natural phenomenon which has been given by God to them so that they can reproduce and they are considering it. If they believe in God, it has been given to them by God and they believe it is impure. I mean, this is something which is, I mean, I am unable to understand why women among us at this age and in this year are still believing in things like that. So that is one sort of a thing. Then, of course, and the socially constructed roles for women with the priority accorded to their household care work, a redressal of gender-based inequalities will continue to be a struggle. We'll have to continue to struggle more and more to get some sort of parity between boys and girls, men and women, unless we slowly also, simultaneously get rid of, that is how I said, bring about a cultural change. And that is what gives me hope when I see the mother. And this year in the gender budget, we have kept money for a textbook module to be introduced in schools. A module on women's rights. Everybody should know the women's rights and the types of practices which are oppressive to women. And you know what, what is happening to, to women because of these oppressive practices. So Bismi should tell us really how law on paper has of course has given us complete equality. You know, irrespective of anything you Gender is not used in the constitution, but says despite irrespective of sex, uh, class, etc., class, etc., you have all sorts of inequalities. But how in practice you find that because of this mindset of people, which still considers, still is operating on the old scenario of women the homemaker, man the breadwinner, how that sort of a thing makes it difficult for law to be put in practice unless, what do we say? We say there's a gender sensitive judge now sitting. That judge makes up, this, you see, uh, so let me just finish this and I'll just end with a little story. So how do we address and overcome the major gender issue facing Kerala as also other states? This whole issue of the unpaid household care work and the fact that they are also uh, um, victims of certain social norms and practices. There is enough evidence to establish the primacy of women and their work in India's growth achievement, which has not been adequately addressed in the planning process. I mentioned that earlier. One has to move beyond a special focus in the chapter on women and child to looking at women as growth agents in India's political economy across all sectors. This would mean that within our overall, we have to have an overall vision of 
how we look at women in our society. So in our overall approach to development of Kerala, as you know, 13th plan also has an approach paper to development, including specifically gender issues, public expenditure would have to be redirected to schemes exclusively for women and making schemes which benefit both of them, making them also more uh, responsive to gender concerns. We know that we cannot have all schemes which are exclusively focused on women because we can't have all universities for girls, all health institutions only for women. Some, so, so many things, the larger part of public expenditure is on programs and schemes which are what we call composite, benefiting both men and women. So our concern for gender should be growing also in those schemes. So this I think is uh, something which we have to, uh, which we are conscious of our doing and which we think that men and women, you know, there's a good mix of boys and girls here, that unless the men and the boys start thinking differently, starting with I don't want a dowry, okay? <laughs> Starting with that, you know, if you people say, you know, this is not something in our hands, our parents are negotiating. But you have to teach your parents. So I'm saying, you know, the men have to play a very important role. And I know that nowadays, you know, there's a lot of uh, importance being given to what is called masculinity and men engaging women. You know, lots of groups have come up where men are saying, we want to help. We want to help establish gender parity. We don't want inequality. So lots of men are working for it. So we really need your help. It cannot be done with women alone. That's something we realize. All the gender awareness classes which is for women, it has no meaning. If the men are standing outside the hall, they have to know what is gender, what is the issue, what is the woman's issue. So we want it to happen naturally. We don't want to have a confrontation. We want it to happen naturally within a household. But the work is shared equally and fairly and in the public places where you don't have a women. What is the what is the problem in women moving at night? Yesterday I was traveling from Pishu to um, Pishu to Tibandam. We reached Tibandam at about two o'clock. So you can imagine the whole dark roads. What is there? What is the threat to women? And I was in the car, of course. Only men. <laughs> there are no animals. There's no lion coming out from the uh, rice field or a tiger springing up from somewhere. The only danger is if men do not harass women, they can walk out at any time. They can walk any time of the day. Is that clear? So this is, you know, when we say women and development, a lot is being done because of this very uh, strong women's movement. They have been at it, you know, especially after that committee on the status of women, the 74 committee as it's called, because so little has been actually been achieved for women. So they have been struggling hard, all the laws which they keep, which they keep diluting over time, that they have been struggling against, you know. In the PWDV Act, yes, the PWDV Act, prevents, what is it? Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act. That was actually drafted by our, uh, what's her name, the very well-known, uh, she was also uh, Deputy Attorney General, Indra Jaisi. Indra Jaisi plus a whole lot of women lawyers actually drafted that law. And they made it very sensitive to women. That means the woman can go to the protection officer and directly write a report. The protection officer need not call the husband to verify it. She can write a report and should be accepted by that. But do you think the courts are accepting it? They are not. So, you know, here is a law which was made by women and very gender sensitive, right to residence. You cannot throw the woman out, that's what the law says. And she gets a residence order, but when she goes home, she's thrown out. No, nobody can do anything unless the police intervene, the community intervenes. So the community participation also becomes very important. Let me now go on, let me uh, stop here, and I hope I've, the message that I wanted to convey is clear. Why we talk about women in development is because we want women to be able to have a, a what should I say, dignified position in society. And they should not always be having to do Narega type of work, but the wages, you know what the wages in Narega are? 271 rupees. Now no, you know 90% of the Narega work in uh, Kerala has been done by women. Because in Kerala, no man is going to work for 270 rupees. Here the wages have become higher. 
and the man's aspirations, they will never work. So man may be unemployed, but the woman goes and gets it 270 rupees a day so that she can run the household. So this sort of a thing should not happen. We are equal and we are equal partners in development. Okay? So thank you so much for inviting me and uh, hopefully people will get interested in reading and learning more about uh, women's position in, uh, in Kerala and elsewhere. What's happening in other countries, that's also very interesting to know. So thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for your thought-provoking lecture. Still, we have... Ask if it comes to a Madam. Madam. Even educated women in Kerala cannot be considered as a homogeneous entity. There exists some serious stratification within women. Those who were born and brought up in patriarchy, inculcating the values of patriarchy, are acting as a strong opposing force against the liberal movements organized by women themselves. So, these women who regard themselves as traditional or conservative is acting as an opposing force who are always in conflict with the women those who have the ideas of liberation or those who carry a progressive influence. So, being an expert in this sector, how can you deal with this issue? And uh, next issue, I want to say that uh, you told the boys that the boys should start to say no to. We don't want dowry and it's a necessity and likewise I want to add to your statement that women should also be trained to say that we don't need men who claim dowry. Yeah. That's also a necessity. But you know, yeah, we want answer the second one. But you know, what the, why does the girl not do that? <coughs> Can you hear me? Why does the girl not do that? Because it's a shame for the family. That's the thing. See, man walks off, no shame. Because society will think something must be wrong with the girl. They, they don't even think it's wrong for the man to walk out. I mean, I have seen marriages where they go to the, this actually happened in, in Kerala, they go to the pandal. At that time, they demand something. I want this. I want a car for the boy. And if the, the girl, as you said, can protest, I have seen girls protesting, but I have seen also families cannot do that because then it's a big shame for them. That's what I'm saying. Unless we conscientize people that look, this is that shameful. There is no, girls should get their share, I'm not denying that. But in poor families actually, the family impoverishes itself to give the dowry. That is not correct. And that neither the boy should ask, and the girl should stand firm. And some families have done it. But you know, the larger section of people who live in a very small, narrow-minded society, it becomes difficult. What was the first thing you said? Yeah, but why should you listen to those elite women? I mean, how has the grassroots movement of women come up? Because there were certain elite, even now there are lots of elite women who might be saying, no, 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 uh, you should not go to temple during this time of the year. It's, it's wrong. Her husband at that time, I said, where is he hiding? If the mother-in-law is beating the girl, or if she's demanding more dowry, the husband should stand up to it and say, no, we don't beat, I don't beat her and neither I'm not going to take any more dowry. The PWDB Act has now been extended to cover, uh, it doesn't say, uh, it used to say, uh, introduction. Because the mother-in-law is what most of <laughs> their people should say, they're talking about men, what about the mothers-in-law? Mothers-in-law have become part of patriarchy, otherwise they will not have that power. You see? So the thing is that the boy should be sensible enough to say no to his mother-in-law. But that's not correct. And neither will I take <coughs> Okay, we have a question. Ma'am, I thank you for the delightful lecture. I actually have two main questions. Uh, I was being taught at a women's college, and uh, it's most of my tab that a girl coming out of women's college is a feminist. Because, uh, yeah, ma'am, there is sexist a tab. And uh, uh, the recent changes, especially in the women collective, WCC, Shabrimala Verdict, I openly suggested my position, and the entire family, including my mom, fought me as a feminist talking enough. And this is the situation of a well-educated mother who is also doing a very uh, normal paid work. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the situation. And if I, uh, and once again I suggested that ma'am, ma ma mama, I want to do entrepreneurship. Then she said, what? You have to do some institution work. No entrepreneurship. And mm -hmm. the second question is, uh, even in Trivandrum, the well-advanced city, there are ex That social development for women is as important as economic development. 
Okay, so they, they have started that. So that is one sort of a thing that you know, feminist to me means somebody who thinks that society is male biased. That's all. There is no other that feminist of the old time, you know, who had, uh, who, you know, who sort of smoke cigarettes just to defy society. You know, they would throw open their doors and say that we, you know, why should we not have the same? This is not the feminism now that we have. It's a very different type. We're just saying that the whole society is male-centered. And that's what we want the people to become conscious about. Your mother also, I mean, I wish you would go to some awareness class where, where or I don't know, uh, maybe some of your aunts and uncles or the rest of the family, is there anyone there who thinks like you, for instance? Yeah, I read a lot and my uncle broke with local books. And she's always <coughs> blaming her man, go and read this girl's wicked book. <laughs> <laughs> so this you have to fight your own battle. Yes. Not everybody you see is somebody you can love, but you know, there are, you know, we've all gone through poet schools and all that. But now because of the television and all that, I think <coughs> girls and boys are much more aware of all these things. We didn't know so much earlier, but now things are different. So, you know, we have to um, educate them about the problems of cyber, uh, you know, uh, how you are asked to make the tea when somebody comes or you sweep the courtyard, if you are a boy in the house, you are allowed to go out and play, you can play longer, you know, you are not asked to make tea if somebody comes to the house. But these things should change, man. So there are lots of women now. See, what you just now said, because since you are planning to bring out a book, book for gender consciousness, definitely you can include on correcting the notion of feminism. Because these days people, they are in fact shy to say that they are feminists. Because the kind or the notion of feminism which they ascribe is very different from what it is. Even I have friends from the male community who proudly claim that they are a feminist. So feminism is not thinking that female communities have an upper hand over the male community, but it's just a matter of parity that everyone is being equal. So since you in your dream project definitely this particular notion this can be corrected. That be uh, it can be uh, my question is regarding uh, the in fact the idea of gender budgeting or gender responsive budget for a pretty long time now it has been there so now my question is regarding to what extent we are able to track the progress of the outcome which is being attained through gender budgeting whether that point whether planning is being done but after that once proposals on based on gender dimensions have been formulated but to what extent that has been implemented or what are the fallacies in the implementation so whether this aspect has been taken care of when gender budgeting comes to next year. Even this year budget, we have mention of gender budgeting. That's my first question. Now, second question is regarding unpaid work, accounting for unpaid work. Because uh, last time we have an infill thesis from our department only. So she uh, dealt with the aspect of unpaid work, accounting for unpaid work. In the end, I said that, but you know what you said about the evaluation and the performance, that is something which is being taken very seriously this year. As I said, I myself feel, you know, we have prepared gender budget, and each year the amount has increased, the percentage of uh, planned funds going for women has increased. And we do it in a very systematic way. There's no cooking up data, you know. I mean, we do it in a very, very systematic way. So nobody can question our estimates. So now we have from, I think it started from 11% in the 17-18. The budget of 16-17 had said at least 10%. This time in the 13th plan, the government had put a, a percentage. That at least 10% should be for women specific. So 17, 18 it went up to, it was actually 11 point something percent, 18, 19 it went up to 14.6 percent and this time it is 19.7, no 16.9 percent, 16.9, almost 17 percent because this was the year of the flood, I was very worried you know, that we may have uh, very little amount, but people will cut down on that first, but what happened was that the government has put a lot of emphasis on creating livelihoods for women. So there's a large expansion, you're saying, now what are we doing for women to increase their employment? Large expansion in Narega from 6 uh, crore person days to 10 crore person days this year and a large expansion in the amount given to Kudumbashri, amount given to Women's Development Corporation. These are all the corporations and organizations which are working for women's employment. And <coughs> then in agriculture and in industry, we are putting money that entrepreneur support programs so much should go to women. The department is putting it like that. And then, an interesting thing, 
But I said, you know, this creating awareness, one way to me is besides the, the, the talks we can have, the, the awareness classes we can have, to bring women out more into public spaces through sports, through art and culture. So this time we give a lot of emphasis on that. And in art and culture, for artists, for filmmakers, you know, this KSFDC, you heard about Film Development Corporation, in their budget, out of the five crores they get, three crores they have kept for two films on women to be produced by women directors or women. So I'm saying, you know, these are ways in which the government is trying to bring about a more equal society by mixing men and women as much as possible. The more you mix them in places where they can do similar things, the better it would be for, rather than always giving a class on. Even the gender awareness classes, they are all being done in very innovative ways, through skits, through group discussions, through they, they, they show you a, a, a film, you know, and then ask you to analyze. You know, so it's all being done in innovative ways so that it doesn't become like a counseling class for everybody. So that is the sort of a thing we are doing. And what was the other thing you asked me about feminism? Now that is, is very well taken. Uh, something else you said. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the women themselves. The women themselves have internalized so much. That's the whole problem. So that is why we are slowly trying to make the women themselves understand that, look, you have internalized something where even when the men want to help in the kitchen, the women will say, no, 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 we don't want your help. You know, there even, uh, she's found instances like that. That, you know, the men want to help in the kitchen, but then the women feel that they might mess up the whole place. You do your cooking and then you walk off. Then they have to clean up the whole, whole place. Which is true also, you know. So, it should, so I was saying, let them do it continuously for a week. Then they'll find out one what is they leave a dirty kitchen, then they have to come back to that kitchen. So you know, I, I agree with you that things are moving slowly, but unless you all open your minds, how can we change? So you know, people here who, who sit and think that there should be a fair distribution of household work, there are no stereotypes. That's all the messages are being given through, and you can use the, uh, the visual media, the most effective, I think. I don't know whether you all have seen some very interesting recent advertisements now. A man is um, washing clothes. Surf, I think. The joyous and important kind of conveying gratitude. I would like to thank each and every one of you for your patient listen, patience and encouraging this session. First of all, I would like to thank Abdul Salim sir for chairing this session and extending his views on the particular topic. Then I would like to thank Siddhi sir for organizing such an important event in this particular topic. And then I would like to extend my gratitude to Brother Vipanna uh, for her in educating and very clear speech. She quoted simple daily life examples of how women are discriminated and moving on to historical concepts about the question of women and other important uh, topics on this. Then she moved on to contemporary issues about women and development and concluded uh, with the introduction of gender budgeting. And then she cited a simple day-to-day day -day solutions for how women, uh, discrimination against women can be uh,